from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay. Hello, I'm Gail Shirazi. I'm the Library of Congress. I'm a librarian in the Israel Judaica section, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, the 13th hour, a reading and discussion of Yiddish poetry of Rivka Basman Ben Chaim, presented by translator Professor Zelda Newman. The program is co-sponsored today by the Hebraic section of the African and Middle East Division here at the library the he and the Hebrew language table in cooperation with the Embassy of Israel. I would like to thank Sharon Horowitz and the Hebraic section, Galina Tavarovsky of the IJ section, Deli Delphine Gamberg and the Embassy of Israel. And we have the cultural officer sitting with us today, Molly Tobin, her third day on the job. Thank you, Aaron Taub head of the Israel and Judaica section, who will also be reading. And a special thank you to our main speaker, Professor Newman. Professor Newman rec received her BA in philosophy from Brooklyn College, her MA and PhD in linguistics from the University of Michigan. Her specialty, well, she's a linguist, but her specialty is Yiddish, Yiddish language and culture but she's involved in a variety of other activities. She's lived in Israel for 30 years, where she helped found Maslan, the Women's Center for Victims of Violence of the Negev. She was elected to the Academy for Awarding Theater Prizes in Israel, and is a former head of Judaic Studies at Lehman College of SUNY. And she has an upcoming biography of the prolific Yiddish writer, Katya Maladowski. She's now retired and living in Beersheba. A few announcements before we begin. Please turn off your cell phones. This event is being taped for a webcast. During the Q&A, we're going to span the audience. So if you do not want to be filmed, please leave during that time. And the, our program announcements for programs we're doing in the future for the Hebrew language table. And the books will be available after the program. So I'm going to introduce Professor Newman. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the Hebraic section of the African and Middle Eastern Studies Division, the Hebrew Language Table, and the Library of Congress. Apparently, the Embassy of Israel is connected with this. So thank you to everybody. As a lover of Yiddish and a bookworm, I'm delighted to be here presenting to you a dual language Yiddish English book, this one over here, the Yiddish poems of Rivka Basman Ben Chaim, and alongside them, my English translations. Nothing could be more fitting. English is my native language. Yiddish is my mamalushan, the language I heard around me. The Library of Congress is an extraordinary institution, and Rivka Basman Ben Chaim is an extraordinary individual. All good literature illuminates the universal by examining the particular, and poetry is the most particular of all literary forms. As I take you through a tour of the poet's work, the universal elements will leap out at you. The particular ones are ones that I will point out, and I'll fill you in on the details. Rivka Basman was born in 1925 in the town of Vilkomil, in what the Jews called Lite, or Lithuania. When she looked back on her childhood, there was one teacher who stood out. Here is her poem about that teacher. It's called My Lehrerin Riva, My Teacher Riva. This is how it goes. I'm going to read it first in Yiddish, and then its translation in English. Mein Lehrerin Riva, wie Sun in a Regen gefangen in Blätter, sunigt geseder dein Unblick in mir, mein Lehrer Riva. Einzig und ebig dein Seun, an emistig wurzeldig wache, die starkste dein Liebe, mein Lehrerin Riva. Arum nehmen tu ich die Skier, was hat mir durch dunkle Scheuben, Bei leuchten a winkel sie koren, wie swarten geduldig die Joren, 
wo Zeit hat, auf sie nicht kein Schlitter. Und dort, in einer Städte in Litte, bei erster Zersongene Äußers, betriefte mit Honig und Röhren, geschlungen dabei, hat dein Schmeichel, und in Umut gelehrt. Mit Stamme der Jugend ist schon, der frühere Griechen dem später, und treffen sich ergens zusammen bei Jammen. Und dort, in einer bläuernden Monum, wird brechestig glien dein Nomen, mein Lehrerin Rive. Okay, here's the English translation. My teacher, Riva. Like sun in a rain caught in leaves, your image shines forever in me, my teacher, Riva. Unique and eternal your vision, a truly rooted vigil, vigil, excuse me, a truly rooted vigil, your love the strongest, my teacher, Riva. So I absorbed the sunset, which has lit before me a corner of memory through dark pains where the years wait patiently, where time has no dominion over them. And there, in a shtetl in Lithuania, at the first sung alphabet letters, dripped with honey and tears, I swallowed your smile, learned in sadness. Ours will probably overlap, the latter reach the former, and meet somewhere together by seas. And there, in a blue remembrance, Your name will gleam pristine, my teacher, Riva. This poem speaks of the first alphabet letters, dripping with honey. It was traditional in Eastern Europe to introduce young children to the Hebrew letters with which Yiddish is written by dipping a letter baked in honey and then giving the letter to the child in the shape of, an, of a letter, let's say an aleph. The child would say aleph, and then swallow the letter. This accomplished two things. It made the Hebrew letters literally and symbolically a part of the child. And it associated Jewish learning with a very pleasant experience. Rivka knew loss at a very young age. Her mother died when she was still a child. Her grandma stepped in. When the Nazis emptied Rivka's town of Jews, Rivka was 14. She held on to her brother, Arle, and some of her poems are dedicated to her brother, Arle, but he was torn out of her hands and she never saw him again. Rivka spent two years in the Vilna ghetto where she met the great Yiddish poet, Avram Sutzkeve. Ten years older than Rivka, Sutzkeve was already a recognized Yiddish poet. When Rivka told Sutzkeve that she herself composed poems, Sutzkeve said, keep it up. That's what will keep you alive. And it did. When Rivka was sent to the Kaisenwald concentration camps, she continued to compose poems. It's been said that at the Warsaw Uprising, the cry went out, Yidin zeitnisch miyayish. Jews, don't be despaired. And in that same spirit of the Nazis can control our bodies, but they can control our spirit, the women of this concentration camp decided to entertain the inmates every day. So at the, at the end of every grueling workday, there were three women who entertained the inmates. One sang, one danced, and one composed a poem and recited it that day. It was Rivka who composed a poem and recited it that every day. This is Rivka's description of that experience. It's called Der Mono. Remembrance, first in Yiddish, Der Mono. Segedeken wich fleg schreiben Lieder, weinen Lieder, schweigen Lieder, auf den reuten Bruck, gendeken mir beim Stechelpleut, von Stechelspitz in tatuiert mein Junge heut. Zu seiner Federmull von Sohn vergangen, von eigenem vergangen letzte Sohn. Gesungen hab ich dämmelt. Und mein Lied, gewein is unser Sohn. Okay, here's the translation. Remembrance. They remember how I used to write poems. Crying poems. Silence poems on the, cobblest on the red cobblestones. Remember me at the barbed fence, my young skin tattooed from barbed points. 
to see a tiny thread of sunset of my own setting in that last sun. I sang then, and my poem was itself our sun. Okay, that's her poem about then. It's worth pointing out that nowhere in this poem or in any poem ever written by Rivka are the Nazis or the Germans ever mentioned outright, never. It's as though the Germans were not allowed to control the spirits of the women and they are not allowed into Rivka's closed world of Yiddish poetry. They're closed off. But that, of course, does not mean that the inmates were able to forget what had happened. The trauma was with them for life. Here is Rivka's honest description of that, and it's called Umruik Zainen Mir. Umruik Zainen Mir. Von Wanderin. Umruik Zainen Mir. Von Suchen a Hell in der Nacht. A Stern soll uns nicht der Sein. Umruik Zainen Mir. Von Bengschaft zu die, wo seinen Kähnmull nicht gestorben und seinen Teut. Umruhig seinen mir, von Vertellen a Präkel breit bis eins zur Vertellung. Umruhig seinen mir, von nicht kennen sich dem Umruh der Zählen. And this is the translation, we are restless. We are restless from wandering. We are restless from seeking a cave in the night so a star shouldn't spot us. We are restless for longing for those who never did die and are dead. We are restless from being unable to tell ourselves of our unrest. So it was exactly as Sutzkevilla had predicted. Rivka found solace in poetry, in her ability to find words for complex emotions and in the satisfaction that comes with the artistic creation. Of course, a poet needs inspiration, and the muse may be fickle, it may not come when it is called. This is Rivka's poem describing the gratification that comes with finding the precise word, le mot juste, that's the way the French call it. Okay, it's called as mit con. Uh, so just a minute, I thought I had it here. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Azbikon. Okay. Azbikon. Uh, Azbikon und man will, wird ruhig in still. Wenn wird a so gut, a so gering, es singt sich allein. De Klangen hängen sich ein in der eigene Ruhe. Selten, wenn trefft a so ruhige Ruhe. Was oft er gegangen ahin, wenn ich weiß, wie er soll und wohin. If you can and you will, it becomes calm and still. When it becomes so good, so easy, it sings by itself, of itself. The sounds listen to their own calm. Rare when there's such a becalmed calm. I'd go there more often if I knew how and to where. So that is, that's her poem on um, poetic inspiration. Back now to the end of the war. By the end of the war, Rivka's father was no longer alive. He was murdered in a camp in Estonia just before the war ended. So at the war's end, Rivka was alone in the world. She met and married Shmuel, nicknamed Shmule, Mule Ben Chaim, after the war in Belgrade. Mula ran the Belgrade station of the organization known as Bricha, the Hebrew word for flight or escape. The members of this organization gathered the stateless Jews, then wandering all over Europe, wanted by no one, and sent them illegally to what was then Palestine. Here then was a young couple just starting life together who took it upon themselves to dodge the Interpol, the Interpol was looking for them, and put their lives in danger to help settle fellow Jews in the one place in the world that was happy to have them. It's not surprising then, then when Rivka and Mullah, her husband, 
arrived in Israel in 1947, they settled in a kibbutz called Hama'apil. Literally, Hama'apil means one who ascends, who goes up. This kibbutz took its name from a passage in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verse 44, and that's the original story of Hama'apilim, those who ascend. Those of you who are so inclined can look it up. Those of you who are not so inclined can ask in the Q&A section. There's a story about why this kibbutz was called Hama'apil. What mattered for Rivka was that on the kibbutz, she could heal. She watched things grow. She got a teaching degree, and then she taught children, and she watched them grow. And that, for her, was therapeutic. Most important, she had Mullah, the love of her life and her life partner. Mullah was an artist. He's no longer alive. This picture that you see here is his picture, and all the prints in this book are his prints. This is a poem addressed to him, essentially, to Mullah. It is called Midir bin Echuig. Mit dir bin ich ruhig und neunt und ich darf nicht behalten kein Wärter, wie Blätter in sonnige Kräun verankert zu sehr Wärter. Mit dir bin ich durch euch mit sich verwurzelt zum strommigen Wunder, was nestigt in Tropens von Licht, a viele beim Wehren verschwunden. Mit dir ist der Tag nicht so steht, nicht besonder der Heint und der Nächten. Und so viel Green Card bekleid. Und du bist der Ebeke Wächter. With you I am calm. If you remember, she spoke about being restless. So with, Shmu with, Mula, with Shmuel, her husband, she is calm. With you I am calm and close. And I need not withhold any words. Like leaves in a sunlit crown anchored in their earth. With you, I'm entirely with myself, rooted to streaming wonder, which nests in drops of light, even as it goes under. With you, the day's not divided, no separate now and yesterday, clothed in endless green, and you're the eternal sentry. You will notice that the book is dedicated to Mullah. Um, Rivka wanted it that way. Never one to avo avoid harsh truths, Rivka had to admit that even as she healed, the pain did not disappear. In the following poem, she speaks of the slow process of healing and the untouched depths of grief. And now Aaron will read the next five poems for you, knowing the depths. <coughs> Okay. Can you hear me? I don't know if you can. So I want to thank Zelda for her beautiful translations. And I also want to say this um, participating in this reading is especially meaningful to me um, because I met Rivka Basman and Chaim in 2009 um, when I was giving a reading at Beis Levik in Tel Aviv. And Rivka was there, was extremely encouraging and supportive. Um, and more recently, for a literary event of contemporary Yiddish poetry, she translated one of my Yiddish poems into Hebrew and did a, a really beautiful job. So I wrote her a little note. So, all right. So, Dinoyen. Mein sich blitterten Eberflach, Eberflach, hast du verricht, verklappt und vereinigt, Bis hat sich an Plekt a Flemmele Licht, und ich hab vergessen von sich. Kaum ich bin verhält, nur die Neuen, sie haben noch gar nicht erzählt. You've stitched my ripped surface, pasted and gathered, until there appeared a tiny light, and I forgot about myself. I'm just about healed, but the depths, they haven't yet spoken. Thank you, Aaron.
I don't know if we're going to show this clip, but I should point out that the second line of the poem you're going to hear is Mima Amakim, and that is a reference to the biblical verse Mima Amakim Kraticha Hashem, or Mima Amakim Kraticha Hashem, from out of the depths, I called, and Rifka's poems are from out of the depths. In the pre World War II era, the Jewish world was divided between the advocates of Yiddish as the language of the Jews and of Hebrew as the language of the Jews. When the state of Israel was young, Yiddish was denigrated as the language of the diaspora, which Israelis were told to get rid of. In the inclusive way that is typical of her, and Rivka does translate from Hebrew to Yiddish and back, Rivka was for bo both and, both Yiddish and Hebrew. She spoke Hebrew, of course, but she joined a group called Jung Yisrael. This was a group of writers that was intent on maintaining and encouraging artistic creation in Yiddish within a Hebrew-speaking environment. And here is Rivka's poem called De Kreuvenschaft zwischen Yiddish und Ivrit, The Intimacy Between Yiddish and Hebrew. Die Kreuveschaft zwischen Jiddisch und Ivrit. Die Kreuveschaft zwischen Jiddisch und Ivrit oder Ivris, wie er soll erklären, erscher wie tief es atemt Jiddisch rein in ein hebräisch Wort, der warm die Äußeres, schenkt sei a welchen Trott. Und dann, wenn Jiddisch erzählt, war Ivris ihre Tränen, twillen beide Lescheunes, die selbige Twille zu Gott. The intimacy of Yiddish and Hebrew. How to explain the intimacy of Yiddish and Hebrew. Perhaps the way Yiddish breathes into a Hebrew word warms up the letters, gives them a softer step. And then, when Yiddish tells Hebrew about her tears, both languages pray the identical prayer to God. In this poem that you've just heard, the poet not only tells us about the intimate intimacy between Yiddish and Hebrew, she actually demonstrates it. Yiddish often takes a Hebrew word and Yiddishizes it. So for example, the Hebrew word for dream is in modern Israeli Hebrew, halom. <laughs> Or in Yiddish, cholum, or cholum. Um, as you may know, tom tomato, tomato pota Yiddish has dialects. So it's cholum in one dialect and cholum in another. From the noun cholom, or as we say in modern Hebrew, Yiddish creates the verb cholomin or cholomin. And we say ze cholomin or zai cholomin, depending on your dialect. They dream. Now, there is a Yiddish noun for the verb to pray, to the verb prayer, and that is tfilah in modern Israeli Hebrew or tfilah in Yiddish. That's how it is. The Yiddish adopts the word and Yiddishizes it, tfilah. But the Yiddish verb for praying is not from that noun. It is the verb davenin. That is the standard Yiddish verb for praying. But in this poem, Rivka does not use the standard, ver the standard verb davenin, Instead, she creates a new Yiddish verb. From the Yiddish tefillah, she makes a new verb, tefillin. And that's not the phylacteries we put. It's the verb that she made from the noun tefillah, to pray. So she takes the verb, the noun tefillah or tefillah, and she makes it into the verb tefillin. It's a possible word in Yiddish. Just because Yiddish can and does draw on Hebrew nouns to make Yiddish verbs. And this is intimacy in action. When Rivka was a child, she read and grew to love the poetry of Kadya Malodovsky. That's, as you pointed out, that's my next project, a, bi a biography of Kadya Malodovsky. Kadya Malodovsky was the most prolific woman writer of Yiddish ever. And right after the Holocaust, Kadya wrote a, pro a poem called El Hanun, translated into English as Merciful God. And in that poem, she railed against God 
and she said to him, choose another people. Now, the way I see it, Rivka responded to Kadja's charge against God in her poem entitled A Weiskeit. A Weiskeit, Farkadja Molodowski. Wenn das Wort der Weiskeit als bedeckt, wollt, wollt ich gewahrt auf dir und in der weißen Welt gefragt auf dein Barrier. Wenn so Wort der Weisheit als bedeckt, wollt ich der Kind dein Trott. Und Wort bei aller Tritt gefragt, a wo nicht da ist Gott. Whiteness for Kaja Molodowski. If whiteness were to cover everything, I would wait for you. And in the white world, I would ask about your footfall. If whiteness were to cover everything, I would recognize your pace. And with each step, I'd ask, so where isn't God? Poets do not speak the language of rhetoric or philosophy. Theirs is a language of sense data. You remember that Rivka's, pri in her private language, the color of beauty and wonder is blue. Remember she spoke about a blue remembrance for the, the, the teacher of her youth. But for Kadya, white was her private color for wonder and beauty. And in this poem, Whiteness, Rivka is responding to Kadya's complaint. She counters that complaint against God by pointing to the beauty and wonder of nature, his world. And she says, is God not there as well? And she leaves that tantalizing question up in the air. From 1963 to 1965, Rivka's husband, Mullah, was Israel's cultural attache to what was then the Soviet Union. There, dodging the ever-present KGB, Rivka met clandestinely with beleaguered Yiddish writers. And here again, her courage came to the fore. In their last years together, Rivka and Muller lived in the artist colony in Tzfat, and that is when he painted this beautiful picture that you see over here of Tzfat in English called Safed. I'd like to share with you two more poems. The first is a poem on friendship called Yinga Fundi Jorin, Younger Than Time. Yinga Fundi Jorin. Waran an alte Freundschaft, jung im Blick, was kommt und rät sich durch, von Karschen Zwitt, verhiet die Saften, was er Honigen hat lang verloren, waran an alte Freundschaft, jinge von die Jahren. Sie kommt und fragt sich heus, auf jederin besonder, a Stillkeit, a behaltene, befreelingt dem sie kochen. Faran an alter Freundschaft, jünger von die Jahren. Younger than time. There is an old friendship, young in appearance, which comes and speaks of cherry blossoms, preserves the sap which a honeybee has long lost. There is an old friendship, younger than time. It comes and inquires about each separately. A silence that's concealed rejuvenates the mind. There is an old friendship younger than time. I wanted to explain to all of you that Jorin literally means years. And I translated it as time. If you knew Rivka's oeuvre, you would know that she often uses the word Jorin to mean time. And I've discussed this with her, and she said, it's okay, it's okay, time is good. So um, it's not by accident. I, I do know what Jorin means, it means years, but that's how she means it here. I owe my editor, Judith B. Kerman, an insight into this poem. There's a line in the poem that Aaron just read for you, which goes like this. It comes and speaks about each separately. So Judith said to me, each what? Each person? Each event, each what? You're, you're leaving it hanging. 
And the answer, of course, is that with genuine friendship, you need not spell out or give voice to everything. If you and your friend are on the same wavelength, you can and do leave things unsaid. And still, there is complete understanding. So that is why Rivka does not say about each what? About each. You know the rest. Your friend knows the rest. The final poem that I want to share with you happens to be the last one in this collection. I think it is a profound insight on the magic of music and its hold over us. It is entitled, Das Lied mit dem alten Refrain. Das Lied mit dem alten Refrain. Das Lied mit dem alten Refrain kommt wieder und wieder zu gehen. Gedenk nicht die Werte genau, nur bang zu der Trär, was in See, was hat nicht gemeure verzeiht, und was sucht als dem Reiter, was reit. Mit goldene Sporen baziert, was kommt und sorgt zu und verfiert. Der Mord gedenkt sie die Trär, und bett in die Werte erschwert, Pagossen mit Siessen gewähn, und noch dem der Alter Refrain. The Song with the Old Time Refrain. The song with the old time refrain returns and returns once again. Exact words elude it, but it longs for the tear in them, which has no fear of time, and still looks for the rider who rides, bedecked in golden spurs, who comes and says and deceives. Then it remembers the tear and seeks a sword in the words, which are drenched with a sweet lament. And after that, the old refrain. So uh, I'm going to give you the way I understand this poem. A musical refrain, this poem tells us, it is hard to shake because it comes with memory and is into anticipation and hopes. And even after the sought after hopes are dashed, the memory of them remains. And we return to the music and the memories associated with it because the sounds are drenched with a sweet lament. Follow with me the music of this poem, the song where the old time refrain returns and returns once again. So here you have word magic celebrating sound magic. Now you know why I wanted to put out this book. Rivka Basman is an unsung hero of the Jewish people, and her poems are a gift to poetry lovers everywhere. Thank you. I to show the clip of Rivka reading one of her poems, and then we'll have a chance for questions and answers. In Stilkeit reid ich Yiddish, mi ma'amakim. By Tog is Gringer reiden Ivrit. Di Jorn was far reiden und antläufen, baroiden von beiderle Schönes betritt. Lite. Die Nodelbeimer stechen meine Tritt. A welcher Teppich vier zum Teutentol, wo alle Beimer gehen mit zum Tehon, was heißt Amol. In jene Wälder von Amol Kleib ich posenkes und ich schwer, a seier Reutkeit is vom Blut und seier Tam a Trer. Die Nodelbeimer stechen meine Tritt, der weicher Teppich narrt mich ob, ahin geht keiner mehr nicht mit, ahin zum Barg Europa. Anybody have a question? Chaim? You know, as well, when you were translating the poetry, 
how, how often, or how long did it take you one to uh, do something? And then how did we you, have to repeat the question. Okay. Over the, the, the question the is how long it takes. Each poem is different. You know, it's like Rivka says, as Bacon and Meville. You can, you can do it and you want it, and sometimes the, it comes and sometimes it doesn't. But there have been times when I'll spend a, um, It'd be nice if you'd get it. There, there have been times when I spend an awful lot of time on a translation, and the next time I look at it, I erase the whole business. Um, every now and then, things work out right, out right but you've got to get, you think of the sense, you think of the rhyme, you think of the meter, and rarely do you get all three. So I know one line, all in all, in this entire collection, which I feel pretty comfortable with, and that's, Ashtilkeit abahalte neba freelink dem zukuren, and which I translated as, a stillness that's concealed rejuvenates the mind, which is as close as I could get, and that requires two things. Ba freelink is a word that does not exist in Yiddish. It's a, made, it's a neologism. The word is freelink, which means spring. And Rivka makes up the word ba freelinked to, you would say, in spring, but that's not a word in English. So I decided on rejuvenates because it fit the rhythm. Ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, rejuvenates the mind. And zikoran is not mind. Zikoran is memory. But I translated it as mind because it's a half rhyme with time and because without your memories, have you got a mind? So it was, it was, Two translations of the sense, the Koran and um, and Bafrilinked, with a with a rhythm that works. But you know, that's so rare that you get a rhythm and a half rhyme and the sense. It, it's almost asking for the impossible. But you try for the impossible, you know. If you don't try, you'll never get there. Any other questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. How did she save her poems? How did she? Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, the so uh, the question is how she saved her poems. When the Nazi camp uh, was liquidated, the Nazis liquidated the camps, they strip, the, they strip the prisoners completely nude, and they weren't allowed to take anything with them. So at the camp, Rivka wrote her poems in micography and rolled it under her tongue. And she escaped with those poems. But she says about those particular poms, although she says uh, it, they were not sublimated enough. She feels that they needed sublimation. She feels they were a scream from the heart. And she hasn't published those. But she says when she meets her maker, she will put them in Yad Vashem. But she feels that the, it, it didn't go through enough sifting. It was too much of a, a scream. And she doesn't think they're good enough. But she says they remember the people who were within the camps remember them. And she certainly knows what they are. And she's planning to leave them with Yad Vashem so as a memory of, as a token of what was. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk about her life in Vilkomir before the Holocaust? Uh, so thank you for What was her background? Her background in Vilkomir. So Rivka told me that in, on the, in Lita, in Lithuania, as the Jews called it then, it was in northern, northeast Poland at the time, there were different shtetlach, and in her shtetl, she says, was a Yiddish-speaking shtetl. So she went to a Yiddish-speaking school. But Mule, Shmuel, her husband, went to a Hebrew-speaking school. So each shtetl had its preferred language. So she went to a Hebrew-speaking school and began the gymnasium and, and never finished. And she got her degree um, later on when she was in Israel. She went to get a teaching degree. But she got to the first year of the gymnasium and then it ended. But it was all in Yiddish, which is how she first knew about Kadya Molodowski. From her, Kadya Molodowski is known in Israel for her children's poems. She's known in this country for her adult poems and her novel, novellas and her short stories and, and everything else. Did she come from a religious background? No, no, no. She said it was a secular background. Um, and so did Muller. There, there was not a religious background at all. Um, She's a very uh, inclusive sort of person. She, she knows that I'm religious, and she always calls me before Shabbos. <laughs> Never afterwards, and she'll ask me what time candle lighting is so that we can, we can have a conversation beforehand. You had a question? Yeah, just one more. I'm so curious. Did, when, when he spoke with her, did she code switch between Hebrew and, uh, Hebrew and Yiddish sometimes? She and I speak Yiddish together. Uh, but she does often switch. Um, and in fact, there's a wonderful story. We were once in Bet Levik, which is the a Yiddish writer's house. And someone said, don't speak Hebrew, speak Yiddish. 
And she said, well, he was also a Jewish language. <laughs> so she has nothing against Hebrew, but of course, Yiddish is, um, as she says in one of these poems, Yiddish lives, Yiddish words live for her instead of people. They are what was left of her world, which is gone. And the Yiddish words are instead of that world. So for her, Yiddish is crucial, but her Hebrew is superior. Unlike most of the other Yiddish writers, Jung Yisroel, um, who may or may not have had such, such a good grasp of Hebrew, her Hebrew, a grasp of Hebrew is terrific. But the poem that you didn't see was in Stillkeit rede Yiddish, in silence or stillness, I speak Yiddish, Mima Amakim. But by day, by day it's easier for me to speak Hebrew, but at night, when she, there's no one around, in her dreams, in her nightmares, she speaks Hebrew. Why is Omima Amaki when she's calling out? Yes, any other questions? Can you say something about the state of Yiddish publishing ah. today? We all know it's not what it was. Yeah, but so the, where are the centers and are people publishing and is there another generation picking up on it? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Yes, yes, is there, how is, what's the state of Yiddish today, Yiddish publishing today? In Israel, I think there's a good deal of hope. Um, there are people still writing Yiddish. Uh, Don Bel Kelo, who, who teaches at the University of Indiana, is a wonderful poet, but he calls himself Boris Karlov. So his, his poetic name is Boris Karlov, and he used to put out books, but now he does everything on the internet. Um, and there's a young man, named, relatively young compared to my advanced old age, uh, named Velvel Chernin in, um, in Israel, and he has won an award for his poetry. So it's still going on, but is there an audience for Yiddish poetry? So here we have to talk about parallel worlds. There's a world of Yiddish speakers growing by leaps and bounds. That's the world of Chassidim. Um, the, Satmer, the Satmer are very careful, and their offspring, the Popa, and all the other Hasidic um, groups, they speak Yiddish from the minute they open their eyes to the end of the day among themselves. But they don't read Yiddish poetry. Now let's go to a parallel world. There's the parallel world of Yiddish poets, but they don't speak Yiddish from the moment they open their eyes to the end of the day. So, um, I do my best to go from world to world. I, I, I'm interested in the living Yiddish of Hasidim, and there's research on that. I did a bit, and there's somebody else continuing at the City University of New York. Um, it's a growing, wonderful, living language. It's not dying whatsoever, but they don't read Shalom Aleichem or Peretz or Mendela. Um, now, will they ever produce their own literary oeuvre? Who knows? Perhaps, but as it looks now, the two parallel lines, they don't meet. There's the world of Hasidim, and they write, but not, not the sort of Yiddish poetry that, like Rivka does. And there's the world of Yiddish poets, but they're not Hasidim. And um, I try to be a bridge, but um, they don't usually talk to each other. I wish they did, but they don't. Any other questions? I have one last one. Can you please talk about the name of the kibbutz, you said you would Ah, okay, it. so, kibbutz HaMa'apil, there's, there's a story in um, the Book of Numbers about the children of Israel, they have just sinned um, and, uh, with the sin of the spies, and Moses tells them they will not enter the land of Israel, except for two who didn't sin, they cannot, they will not, they have to wander in the desert. And after he tells them this, defiantly, um, they decide to, uh, vaya, it says, Vaya'apilu el roshahal, they, they ascended the, the top of the summit of the hill, and they tried to enter, and they were routed, and they, Moses said, if you try, you'll, you'll be defeated. They tried, they were defeated, they didn't manage. So after the war, the Zionists looked around. There's a traditional understanding in, in Jewish thought that there'll come a day when there will be peace in the whole world, justice will reign, and God will gather the, do an ingathering of all Jews to the land of Israel. Well, the Zionists looked around after the Holocaust, and guess what? There was no peace all over the world. Um, justice did not reign, and there didn't seem to be any way God was taking the children of Israel to the land of Israel. And they said, we're defiant. We're going to do it. There was a song, um, Ha'pilu el let us ascend the hill. 
and we'll manage, we'll do it, we won't be routed, we'll succeed, we'll enter the land of Israel. They called themselves Ma'apilim, based on the defiant ascent, but they said, we won't, we won't lose, we'll get it, we'll get into the land of Israel. And this kibbutz was called Hama'apil. We will get into the land of Israel, we will do it. Um, if we wait too long, there'll be no Jewish people to, to bring there. So these were the early Zionists, and remember she and her husband were, were part of this group who illegally brought Jews to Palestine. So they went to this kibbutz, which was part of Hama Apilim, those who believe that there was, there's a chance for the children of Israel to get together on their own. And yeah. Um, can you talk about your translation process? I mean, do you work with her? Do you show them to her? Repeat the question. Okay, the, uh, Aaron's question is, do I work with Rivka? So, um, at the very beginning, I showed her a, what we call in Hebrew, a buchta, a pile of poems. And I was really concerned because she did not think anybody had done a good job so far. And she looked at poem after poem, and she had not encouraged me at all. We had never known each other. And she said, it's a waste of your time and mine. No one's ever done an okay job. And after she looked at, I don't know, the 20th translation, she looked at me and she said, bullseye, bull in Hebrew. So we became friends, and she thought I did an okay job. But when I lived, when I taught at the City University of New York, she would send me poems in the mail. And then I'd write her back or I'd see her when I came to Israel and we'd discuss it. And every now and then there's a word that could be either a noun or a verb and I'll say, you know, which one is best. We sit together often just by ourselves um, in Beit Levik and I show her my translations and we talk, we shoot the breeze. She tells me the background of her poem sometimes. Um, we, it's wonderful hours I have memories of, just her and me alone in this big room. Um, not always has she seen every um, translation, but she trusts me, and I, I hope I don't betray her trust. Um, on the whole, she knows most of these, and I myself am not happy if the, you know, with some things. I'll, I'll change it next time. <laughs> There's no perfection in this, in this business. Has anybody done a biography of her? And if not, have you thought maybe that would be one of your projects? Well, right now I want to finish the one on Kadya Molodovsky, uh, who, um, who had some things about her life that were pretty much not known. Uh, Rivka is very not, she's very careful about people um, not talking about her. She's a very non-assertive person, very private, and I when one person wanted to do a movie about her, she was hesitant. There's some things she doesn't want to talk about. She doesn't talk about the details of what happened on the, in the camps. She does not want to, and you have to respect her privacy on that. Um, with me, she's told me parts about her life, but I think she wants her poetry to speak for her. That's my impression, that she doesn't especially want a biography. She wants her poems to speak for her. That's, I, I could be wrong, but that's my impression. Um, I would ask her about it, but right now, poetry, she wants to spend, she put out a book in 2016, we're in 2016 now, she is 90 years old, and she published a book this year. Yeah. So, two more questions. Um, have her poems been translated into other languages? And then also, um, given that she has so many books out, how are you able to winnow them down? Ah, okay. So the first question is, has she been published in other languages? She has indeed, in, in many. I don't know how many, but I know her Hebrew translator is named Roy Greenwald, who is a, a dear friend of hers, and I I'm like to think he's a friend of mine. He teaches at Ben-Gurion at the University of the Negev. Um, he's her Hebrew translator, but she's, she's been translated into German and into Swedish and into, I, I think, Korean in all, and, and in French, if you look at the back of the book, there's a woman named Sabine who, who has done her translations into French. There's, uh, there's a, um, a website for it, and she's, she's, uh, you can see it online. I don't know how many, but quite a number. Um, your second question was? Um, how are you able to winnow down? She's uh, large, oh, yes, and each time I think, oh, I didn't include that one. What a pity. Um, I... I I can't even decide really. There are some that are favorites. The, the poetry about, the poem about friendship is one of my favorites. Um, there are some that I really love. The, poet, the last poem of Das Lied mit dem alten Refrain. Some I love for their rhythm, some for their sense. They're all beautiful. It's hard. It, I don't know, it's almost like deciding between your, your children. It's very difficult. Um, I don't know how I decided. Um, it was what I thought would give enough of a... Um, a range 
She has one poem called An Enfer, which is what we call in Yiddish Ashtoch. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it's uh, like she's this woman of sweetness and light, but she knows how to answer, well, I don't want to say with a barb, but she has all kinds of, she's an honest person, and when she feels it's necessary to, um, to let someone know, it's someone who she says, at their heart lies a stone. Not exactly a compliment. Um, so it's hard. I try to give one like that so that you know that it isn't all wonderful. And she's a woman who's known pain. I didn't include the one poem she considers her political poem. One. I once said to Rivka, you know, you, know, you don't write about politics. She said, oh, I did once. I said, what was that? It's the poem about how we should never give out a death sentence. That's the poem, we should never have a death sentence. And you might think it's because we're all human and we're all created in God's image, no such thing. We should never punish anyone, give them a punishment of death because life itself is painful. Let them live, <laughs> let them suffer. So you never know what she's gonna say. That's what she considers her one political poem. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did she ever um, mention anywhere in the poetry about some of the classic poets like Paris Marcy? Yeah. Okay, so in, in the 1960s, early 1960s, she went to, um, to, to Vilna and, and she went through Poland on their way home from the Soviet Union. And she has poems there and they are extremely difficult. One at Paris's gravesite. Um, it's so hard to translate, I tried. When you have a word like medrish and sod, you, you can't tra translate that with one word. You know, I could talk about pardes and pshat and remesh and drash and sod. It it's requires paragraphs. So I couldn't include that because it's just not easily translated. Those were the, the ones which were um, the, me the, the references. She has a poem in this book which I think um, reprises Archibald MacLeish, a poem should be palpable and mute as a globed fruit. And she has one here, which is a poem, is a, a plum, and it, it's very, it's, it's structure is like that, and it's um, sense is like that. Um, so she's pretty smart, and she reads an awful lot, but she really mentions them by name. And she has a few references to Sutzkeville. Uh, so yeah, but, but you've got to know enough to know, just as you've got to know that when she says Mima Amakim, it's a reference to Mima Amakim Krati Hashem. You know, it's, she says a lot with very little. So the more you know, the more you understand. Mm -hmm. I came late, I'm afraid. Apologies. So perhaps you mentioned this. Was she published by Sutskova in the Golden Akate? Absolutely. That's how I got to know about her. I had a subscription to the Golden Kate, and I, every time I saw a poem of hers, it moved me. So I would sit when the kids were quiet or I had some free time and I'd do a, a translation. Then after years of accumulating translations, I actually, I called the kibbutz and I said, I, I went to the library. Those days, libraries are not what they are now. And they looked it up and said she lived in kibbutz Amapil. When I called kibbutz Amapil, they said, oh, Rivka left years ago. But if it's Tuesday, she's at the dentist. And if it's Wednesday, and if it's Wednesday she's in Beth Levy, and they were right. So um, I knew her from her work in the Golden Akate, not from her collections. I didn't know those. Then, of course, I, later I, I, got, I got copies. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Did you consider having footnotes for some of the harder? Uh, the only, there's one footnote in here. Exactly. Yeah, there's one here which is, uh, perhaps I should have on me, ma, ma, me, ma, ma, kim. There's one footnote here, and that's with the word yisker because the editor said, well, who knows what Yisker is? Okay, so we had a little footnote about Yisker, but no, I didn't, and perhaps that's a mistake. I don't know. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming, and I want to thank Rick Guy. It was a wonderful talk. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.